we're happy to have Kitty Snow with us today, who grew up in nearby Bon Air. She graduated from Huguenot High School and attended both Longwood and VCU. She worked for CMP Telephone, where she was the first female telephone installer slash repairman assigned to Church Hill, Oregon Hill, Jackson Ward, and other downtown neighborhoods, which makes her particularly expert at investigating <coughs> photographs of our fair city. Uh, and she also worked for the marketing department of Bell Atlantic. Since 1986, she's been a realtor and is the owner of Home Team Realtors. She's written several books based on her great-grandfather, Harry Stilson's photography, the most recent being From Richmond to France, Images and Stories of Richmond and Her World War I Soldiers, a collection of images and stories of Harry's son and other young men in Richmond during the Great War and after the armistice. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Kitty Snow. Thank you all for coming. Get myself organized here. A couple of things to mention before I start. Some images you, you'll see aren't exactly what I'm describing. Uh, my great grandfather didn't know that I would be sharing his photographs a century later. So he sometimes didn't provide the um, actual pictures for what I'm, you know, what I'm describing and discussing. So I'm going to make some substitutions. You'll see those. One example of Harry Stilson's bad behavior in that respect, I've been looking for a picture of Maggie Walker for years. His streetcar stopped at her bank. Hundreds of his pictures are in Jackson Ward where she lived and worked. And um, I still can't find a picture of Maggie. I do, however, have her bank building, uh, St. Luke's Bank at First and Marshall in the background there. So it's now a parking lot, but this is what the kind of substitutions that I'm talking about. <laughs> Second thing, I don't clean up my sources grammar or their language uh, in my books and programs. I like my history unedited. So when I quote my great uncle Leon, you'll hear his words as he wrote them, bad grammar, run on sentences and all. Uh, and lastly, I've included um, postcards in this presentation that were in the Stilson material but they're not taken by Harry or family members. And I think you'll recognize those as uh, uh, postcards when they appear. Okay, now that I've given those disclosures, let's, can you tell I'm a real estate broker? I'm giving disclosures here. Uh, let's take a streetcar ride about 100 years ago. Richmond, Virginia in 1917 was a kaleidoscope of contradictions. Uh, Horse-drawn wagons shared cobblestone streets with Model Ts. You can see both in this picture. Um, Streetcars rumbled down Broad Street, uh, and this is, of course, in um, 17th Street, so down in the bottom. Uh, they shared, uh, they rumbled down Broad Street, and families went swimming in Shields Lake and Bird Park. Yep, Shields Lake. I know. <laughs> Don't see that today. Uh, into, um, but we were the state's capital. Uh, and you would think we would be very important by being the state capital. Uh, this is my great uncle and his friend Denny, and they're in front of the uh, pigeon coop. By the way, pigeons were really big. Carrier pigeons were really big in World War I, and Harry was into that. So that's his pigeons in the background. But uh, we were in the state capital, but our social network was more like a small town. Um, this is 17th Street. Uh, the, these are just soldiers on 17th Street. Not sure what the event was. But into this colorful mix of Richmond spilled the blackness of a world war, leaking into the lives of Americans everywhere and changing Richmond forever. 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the end of the Great War, so this story's time has come. My book, From Richmond to France, is a story of Richmond and of my family. My great-grandfather, Harry Stilson, drove a streetcar, but his passion was photography. His son, Leon, also worked for Virginia Railway and Power as a streetcar conductor. And this is the two of them. They're uh, in Carytown, we call it now, Grayland Avenue, which was Chafin Street when they lived there. Uh, so right behind Carytown. 
Uh, but through, uh, through images and letters, we follow Leon to France. From Richmond to France is also about other Richmond soldiers described by their relatives, and in some cases, the actual words of those who served. As the war unfolded, Harry Stilson was on the West Clay Line in Jackson Ward, running his streetcar, camera beside him, documenting his city as it experienced a war like no other. This is uh, Richmond Hotel, which is basically across the street from the Capitol downtown. Don't know what the event was. Prior to entering World War I, the United States maintained a very small army of about 135,000. The Selective Service Act of 1917 drafted 2.8 million men, one of whom was Leon Stilson. This is them on their way. Uh, he left for Camp Lee, now Fort Lee, in September 1917. This is, they're down in the bottom. Um, if you know where, like, um, Southern Express is the train station they left from. Harry, I mean, uh, Leon is the one with the white bag under his arm, the taller man beside him. It's William Grubbs, and when this picture showed up in the newspaper, their, uh, Mr. Grubbs' granddaughter called me and said, I just saw my granddaddy in your picture. That was cool. Um, anyhow, African-American recruits marched through Jackson Ward on their way to boot camp. It's possible that some of the men whose experiences I relate in the book are in this or other Stilson images. Trains transported soldier boys, as everybody called them, to uh, boot camp and to ships where they sailed for France. Dolores Miller shared a tragic story about her uncle. As trains slowly moved through the city, kids sold candy to the soldiers on board. Her uncle was a kid selling candy when he fell into the Kanawha Canal and drowned. When she related that story, it sounded familiar and for good reason. I found an entry in my great-grandfather's journal that read, Mrs. Elam's nephew drowned in the canal. I knew the Elams lived next door to the Stilsons, but not that my friend Dolores was related to them. Dolores' great-aunt Fanny Elam lived next door to Harry Stilson. Harry's neighbor was related to the little boy who drowned, and so was my friend Dolores. I think the Elam's son-in-law, uh, Jack Proctor, is uh, in this picture of the USS Kentucky that Harry took a picture of. So you can, he just took their picture and made a picture of it. But you see from this kind of story why I say Richmond, not six degrees of separation, maybe two. I have a dozen examples of those weird connections like the one I just described. Petersburg's Camp Lee was a disorganized affair. Leon described his first day this way. And here you go with the run-on sentences in the grammar. Arrived at camp yesterday about 12 o'clock. We were taken to headquarters and checked up from there to hospital headquarters and assigned to Company B, but they did not have room for us. They sent us on to K, where we got dinner. Leon is right in front of the man that's standing in the doorway uh, on the front row. Uh, we were taken uh, to K where we got dinner. After dinner, the captain told us he did not know whether we would stay in that company, but to stick around. After a while, we were called out and signed up to a straw mattress apiece, which we filled with straw. Just as we had got straight, we were called out and told that we had been ordered back to Company B from Company K. I went to Company B and had to leave the mattress that I had filled nice and full of straw myself. And that's Leon on the far right. Arriving at Company B, we were assigned to quarters on cots and given a mattress half packed with straw and two blankets. A few minutes later, an officer came in and told us to return one of the blankets as they did not have enough to go around. Equipment and supplies did not improve. Leon wrote, we hope to get uniforms this week. We're measured for overcoats this morning, uh, but will not be allowed to wear them till we have the rest of our outfit. I think they're serving out overcoats so as to somewhat take the place of blankets so we will not freeze at night. This, uh, Leon is standing in front of Hartshorn College, which was the first African-American women's college in the United States that gave a baccalaureate degree. And it's where uh, Governor's School stands today. Got a lot of pictures I have that are right there at Hartshorn. 
Leon went on to explain, I don't mind the life here half so bad. We get all we want to eat, though it won't be always just what we want. You hear so much about the black coffee they have in the morning. We have not seen any of it yet. The coffee we have is merely water, just colored. Camp Lee's recruits suffered deprivations like that coffee and had to do their own laundry, my goodness. But so did civilians during the war. The Stilsons resided in the city, but the maternal side of my family lived in Bonaire, a train ride from Richmond without shops or services, pretty isolated. The nearest neighbors to our family home on what's now Huguenot Road were a mile away. Now this photo is not from the Stilson collection, but the other side of my family. And my mother explained that when her uncle, Stephen Cowan, right here, went into the army, her mother and 15 year old, his mother and 15 year old sister were left alone. That sister was my grandmother, Sue Sneed Fleming. Steve's job at CNO Railroad was the only income the family had, so when he left home, they lost income, manpower, and food source because he was always hunting squirrels, always providing meat. My mother remembered a favorite treat of her childhood that was a product of World War I. She said Nanny made wartime cakes. That's what they ate because money was scarce. They had little fried pork bits. I guess they'd be called saltback, but she called them little meats. Nanny would fry them till they were crisp. She'd mix meal, salt, and boiling water and fry them in the grease from the pork. Wartime cakes. Mom also told this story. During that time, a man cornered Mama in the storeroom and tried to kiss her. She picked up a pot and hit him so hard he never came back. She went on to describe another crisis. She says that winter, it was just Nanny and Mama on the family place. They'd run out of firewood and were looking around for something else that they could burn. They were getting kind of desperate. And a black man pulled up in a cart. Oops, I'm going backwards this the wrong way. There we go. Uh, a man pulled up in a cart full of wood to sell. Mama and I decided that we owe our family antiques to the man, not this one, but a man with wood for sale. My mom continued with her stories. She said they had to handle any emergencies. They had to go down the hill to the spring to get water when the well went dry. It's hard to walk up that hill empty-handed, much less with buckets of water. They had to have at least one horse uh, for transportation, and if they had a cow, cow had to be milked. So literally, all of America went to the Great War, and they all served in that war. Back at Camp Lee, the recruits were away from home, perhaps for the first time, and sometimes they got into trouble. Leon reported this story. A private took a corporal home with him to Richmond last Saturday. I'm not, whoops, I'm sorry. There we go. I have, must have bigger fingers than these buttons. Um, but anyhow, Leon reported a private took a corporal home with him to Richmond last Saturday, and the corporal went out of a house where they had went to visit and took the private's automobile, which he did not know how to drive, and proceeded to go crazy on Broad Street and ended up by smashing the car up against a tobacco factory. Now he is in jail. Whoops. Now he's in jail with a $50 fine unpaid. I think the captain's gonna try to get him out tomorrow morning. Organizations like the Red Cross and the YMCA influenced camp life. Leon wrote, the YMCA does a great deal for the men here in camp and we hope to open a non-commissioned officers club very soon. And later he wrote, our NCO club is now a sure thing. Have a good sized room that will look very nice when it's all fixed up. Have some fine chairs and tables now. The officers club is gonna give us some books and a Victrola and records. You know, I have Harry's Victrola and his records, and I've wondered which records Leon might have listened to at Camp Lee and if they made him homesick. Uh, he wrote about being lonely and about being homesick, but only to his mother. Leon described a new experience for him. This company had a smoker last Tuesday night. I don't think the word applies very well. 
we had five or six wrestling matches and four or five boxing matches. Now, if y'all see the sticks those men are using, they're playing carom, which is like a, I guess you'd call it like a miniature version of pool. And that's what they were doing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, after that was over, Leon says, and in between, bouts of plenty of music, a piano, banjo, violin, and singing. Then we went downstairs to the mess hall to eat all the ice cream and cake we wanted. Then the cigars and, to, and cigarettes were passed out, speaking of that tobacco industry, and the men were given permission to smoke in the mess hall, which is against rules all other times. The lights were put out at 11 o'clock and everyone went to bed. That was Leon's first smoker. Time passed and off-base missions were assigned. Leon wrote, we will guard water plants, powerhouses, and railroad bridges and such like. When he mentioned powerhouses, he was referring to his former employer's facilities. Virginia Railway and Power substations were called powerhouses because they generated water power and power for um, streetcars, which of course Leon was familiar with. He went on to say, we will commence to find out what real soldier life is like as we will have to sleep in tents, at least some of us will, and maybe some of us will have to cook our own eats. And afterwards, he complained, we were guarding one of Virginia Railway and Power Company power plants, a water reservoir that supplies water to Petersburg and Camp Lee. I have never been in a much more smoky, dirty place in my life. Now, these pictures are inside another one of his employer's um, powerhouses in Jackson Ward. And my oral history sources uh, tell me that it was very, very noisy in there, but they never mentioned it being dirty. This is another version of that building. One of the most frustrating mysteries in what I call the Great Harry Stilson Adventure was the Stilson Code. Harry Stilson wrote in code that consisted of dashes, dots, things like that. Oops, I'm going backwards again. Here we go. Uh, I contacted the military, even the Smithsonian, but no one returned my calls, and the code remained unbroken until my friend Richard Noldy took a shot at it. I was just sure that Leon's coded postcard contained a secret message from the past. <laughs> When, Rich was, when Richard's translation arrived, I was disappointed to read, Dear Father, I just received a letter from Auntie this morning in which she said that Uncle Glenn had went insane and burned the house over their head. <laughs> Obviously, Uncle Glenn suffered from Alzheimer's that runs in the family. But I suspect Leon was practicing that code at Camp Lee with the intention of bypassing censorship once he got to France. Now, Leon's uh, semaphore skills were a little easier to, uh, code to break. Flag signals were a wartime method of communication. When I found Leon's flag sequence here, I was thrilled, thinking I was going to translate a message from the past. He was simply spelling Stilson. Uh, you know, it's so disappointing at times. Of course, recruits re received uh, weapons training at Camp Lee, and uh, Leon wrote, the company has been on the rifle range since last Friday. The work isn't very hard, but we have to get up at 5.20 a.m. and keep steady to go until after 6 at night. I have been working in the pit, uh, raising and lowering and marking targets. We are down in a trench, boarded up, and a cover part way over top. And this is down in this trench he's talking about. Uh, and we run this target up from the back side of the trench. When the target's hit, we pull it down and pass a piece of paper over the hold and run it back up and put a marker in front to show where it was hit. I done some pretty fair shooting. I don't think there's more than two or three men in the company that made a higher score than I did. Those sharpshooting skills of Leon's influenced his role in combat and in his future. Then the family received a service postcard that simply read, I have arrived safely overseas. <coughs> Leon had gone to war. Many of the Stilson photographs are mysteries, like this one. Okay, how in the world did Harry Stilson get a burial at sea 
And it is a barrel at sea because the long I looked, longitude and latitude, it's right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So I found the answer in Harry's journal. He and his sister Vera had gone to the beach for a two-day vaca two vacation. He even tells you that. He wrote, Vera and I took CNO train leaving Main Street Station at 7 a.m. Arrived in Newport News Pier at 10.20 a.m. Two fares, $5.60. And this is my great aunt Vera and just two ladies that she met. She sent, they, they sent them pictures. I have records of that. Uh, but they also went to Virginia Beach. And this is the boardwalk at Virginia Beach uh, back in the day. Um, so then along the way, Harry met a sailor, and he wrote, a young Navy officer gave me some negatives he had taken on the way over and in France. Mystery solved. Harry developed pictures for a returning Naval officer, and a century later, we can experience that sad burial ceremony. And of course, that's last look at the ocean, as they said. And this picture of this little girl, this little French girl, was included in that film that came back from France with that soldier. Uh, sailor. Letters from overseas were rare. Leon wrote, Dear Mother, it has been some time since I wrote you a letter. I have run over France a great deal in the meantime. I've been in the front line trenches twice, once with NCO, only once with the company. The last, some shells got pretty close to us going in. We were pretty lucky. We had no men killed or wounded. Other companies had both. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. It says a street scene in Paris, thousands just like it. Uh, so this is kind of the scenery he was seeing as they went through France. And then he goes on to say, while in the line, I went over the enemy's old line, saw quite a bit of their weapons. The ground was so torn up by shells that it looked like one shell hole was on another. I also looked around in a village that had been in no man's land. I seen one large house that must have been the property of a wealthy man in peacetime, almost completely torn to pieces. Again, just to give you an idea, that's some of the big buildings there. You would be surprised how close some of the people lived to the firing line. We stayed in one village two nights where people were living. There was a large gun right behind us. People were harvesting their crops within easy reach of enemy shell fire. And again, I don't know if you can read that. It says, farm wagon um, uh, in France, the French are taxed according to the width of the road they use. We might want to consider that. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, um, he talks about, uh, about how close they were. Meanwhile, back here in the States, uh, the war continued, and Harry documented victory bond drives. This uh, five-ton tractor was part of one of those parades on Broad Street, as was this uh, Horitzer. That building in the background is, was a, the original First Baptist Church, which was then passed on when they moved a couple of blocks up. It was passed on to the African-American congregate, part of the congregation. Uh, now it's uh, the Randolph Minor Annex, part of VCU. <clears throat> you know, patriotic pride was really obvious here in Richmond. This little boy's even wearing a miniature uniform. Harry sold photographs to support his hobby, and this was one of his big sellers. This plane was on display at the state fairgrounds on, on the boulevard, or the boulevard, as my grandmother would have said, where the diamond is today. Harry wrote in his journal, went home by way of state fairgrounds to see and picture airplane, which brought 10 men here and was injured but his notes failed to adequately describe the appeal that airplane had for Americans. The Hanley Page aircraft was instrumental in support of ground troops in the 1918 spring offensive on the Western Front. It had an American-made Liberty engine, one of 107 aircrafts powered by that motor. America was really proud of their contribution. Harry also captured this. Yes, it's an airship. It's on the side lawn of the state capitol. I've gone down there and checked, but I don't know how in the world they got it there. Uh, Richmonders, like most Americans, were proud to support our troops in bond drives and parades. When armistice was declared, our soldiers came home, but it took a long time to get all those men back, so it took months. This is what y'all call the Science Museum. I still call it Broad Street Station, and that's the soldiers returning home uh, 
after the war. The Blues and Grays arrived from France in nine, June 1919, uh, and their return was celebrated with a week of parades like this one on Broad Street. A common misconception is that the African-American World War I troops uh, didn't fight in battle. David Deems, Jr. of Jackson Ward, participated in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive like Leon did. William Dunlap, who lived only blocks from the Stilsons, suffered wounds that he described as being from machine guns in both legs at Champagne. Jackson Ward's Warwick Cowles was awarded a minesweeper badge from the Navy. Those Richmond men came home. Others did not. One Richmond soldier boy who did not come home was my great uncle Leon. This is the original telegram that we got. Harry went to Broad Street Station to meet returning troops, hoping to find men who'd known Leon. He was already corresponding with a Petersburg man, Thomas Ivey, whose son George had asked his father to locate Leon Stilson's family. George Ivey wanted to know if Leon had survived. They were part of a three-man gun crew in the Argonne Forest. Now I'm gonna to quote to you from Thomas Ivey's letter that he sent my great-grandfather. My son stooped to put in the magazine for your son. He had not straightened up when Leon crumpled up and fell over. Down on his knees by his side, George asked him, what did you see? And your son managed to answer, 200 yards straight ahead, 40 feet up. My son dropped into Leon's place and put the gun to work. His third shot brought the German dog dead, gun and all, from a tree. The letter related how George dragged Leon to shelter and covered him with his own overcoat when Leon complained of the cold. Mr. Ivy concluded by saying, so you see, Mr. Stilson, your son was shot down at my son's side. Had he been the second gunner instead of my son, of course, my boy would have gotten the bullets. Not many families have an eyewitness account of how their loved one was killed 100 years ago. Richmond's African-American troops came home, and Jackson Ward prepared to, wel to welcome them. Uh, in Jackson, of course, that's Leon. In, in Jackson Ward, this is uh, the preparations for the parade. Do you know where the Kroger is on Broad, uh, Lombardi, and between Lombardi and Bow on Broad? Sorry. Um, so if the Kroger would basically be back behind me here, and you're looking, uh, so you're looking north, that's Lee Street, and they were getting ready to, uh, for the parade. That's Sitterdine Lumber Building in the background. They celebrated with a parade that included the veterans of earlier wars, right here, and the Elks. The Elks were part of everything that happened in town. And whoops, right there, that's the drum major of the Elks. They had parades every Sunday. And then uh, this is a rare photo of the African-American troops on Lee Street near Moore Street Church coming home. My book includes photographs of a unique part of, Richmond, of uh, American history. Congress arranged for mothers and widows to travel to France to see their loved ones' graves. These journeys were known as Gold Star Pilgrimages. This is the, um, this is the uh, harbor in New York the building on the far right is under construction. That's the ABC or the Google building in the background. So um, my great-grandmother went on one of those Gold Star pilgrimages. Uh, and my great-grandfather, Harry, taught his wife how to take pictures so that she could bring them home for him to develop them. Of course, this is the Statue of Liberty here. Photographs aboard the President Harding and the Le uh, Levantian Leviathan, I never say it right. The, Levi the, Le 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 the Leviathan <laughs> reflect elegance that was unfamiliar to most of those uh, Gold Star mothers. I don't think Mary Stilson had seen many swimming pools anywhere, but certainly not on a ship. I know. And I doubt that even though um, she had gone to the state fair and they had horse racing, I bet she hadn't seen horse racing like that. So the Gold Star pilgrimages are a snapshot of France in the early 1930s with street scenes um, that include towers and toilets. That's a toilet. 
pretty fancy looking. We couldn't figure it out until we finally looked at the bottom and read it. Paris has these toilets on each block. Oh, now we know. Events included laying a wreath at the Arc de Triomphe, which my great grandmother's the second one from the left, end on the left. Um, and then seeing the Eiffel Tower, which Mary could see from her uh, hotel room. This Paris map was included in her memorabilia from the trip, and the Michelin Company advertised in that map, 1932 version. Who knew the Michelin man was so old? <laughs> On a boat tour of the same, uh, Mary photographed these women doing wash and it probably made her grateful for her ringer washing machine she had back in Richmond. The most significant part of the trip, of course, was traveling to Verdun and the cemetery where their uh, sons were buried. And this is one of the views. The Great War uh, was celebrated here, but France was so grateful for our efforts there that we uh, we have some memorabilia from there as well. Each mother was presented with an artillery shell converted uh, into a vase, it says Verdun down there, which I have, by the mayor of Verdun, as well as a bit of earth from the grave uh, in a little cloth bag. The Great War was different from any previous war, and its aftermath is evidence of that. This is Broad Street. Parades and celebrations shared space with memorials and grieving. Armistice Day, this is Brown 9th and Broad right here. Armistice Day was remembered every year with parades and bells ringing at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month. Each year offered more events to commemorate the war. Yep, these subs are in Rockets Landing. Yep. <laughs> and they were in the first uh, celebration of Navy Day. We had ocean liners coming in and out of Rockets Landing. Uh, and then this version is hand tinted by my grandmother of the, that same display. Mothers found comfort among other Gold Star mothers as they remembered the little boys they'd loved and the young men they had lost. In 1932, the Caroline was dedicated as a memorial. Uh, it was a memorial to the Great War and the Stilsons were part of those events. Uh, this is while it's under construction still, and this was the first structure in Richmond that used uh, steel scaffolding, and you can see that on the, on the sides up there. <clears throat> uh, during that dedication, this is a picture from the dedication, uh, Gold Star Mothers sold commemorative pins as a fundraiser. Uh, Mary Stilson acted as a hostess and drafted her grandson, my father, as assistant salesman, and I'm wearing one of her pins today. You know, healing can take various forms, and for Harry Stilson, that meant immersing himself into, the, into photographing the people, that's the, that's the pen that I'm showing up there, into the people and uh, events of the war and the armistice afterwards. This is the Robert E. Lee statue on Monument Avenue, and that's um, French General uh, Ferdinand Folk um, laying a wreath. Uh, so Harry documented our soldier boys coming home. Whoops. Coming home, again, that's uh, the Science Museum in the background. And scenes of America mourning its dead and restoring itself. He participated in Navy Day at Rocket's Landing like we talked about, and see, this gives you an idea of how big a, a harbor it was. Um, he participated in that, and he captured homecomings and other events on film. His images are our passport to the days when Richmond's boys sailed to France, and when they marched down Broad Street with the viaduct in the background uh, when they came home at the end of the war. The Great War came to Richmond, and Harry Stilson's camera recorded it so that we can be there, too. This is Harry. Thanks to Harry, soldier boys who went to war from Richmond to France became people that we now know and we can care about. And I want to thank you for wanting to know those boys as well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to call for questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I'll either know the answer or I'll make one up. Thank <laughs> you.
So anybody have any questions? One thing I was going to mention in this, and I, if like, maybe you think of some questions, but uh, Harry, I mean, uh, Leon, you know, he was promoted before when he was just when he was brand new in the army. He was promoted. He was promoted to corporal. And then we have in his letters, he thought about it and decided that if he kept on getting promoted and became an officer, that he had less chance of coming home. Uh, he just was sure that the officers were who they will pick off. And so he asked to be put down as a, a private again. <laughs> so when you see his, mater you know, his materials, he has a letter that actually says, now you refer to me again as private. <laughs> so didn't help him, though. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Killed, given any, were the families of the men who were killed uh, given any um, uh, payments? Yes, and I was thinking when you started asking, I knew what you were going to ask. I have documents. Harry had to do, he had to go about getting uh, the money that he was supposed to be given, and it was a matter of a few hundred dollars. But he also had insurance. Um, he'd gotten insurance on, they had on, um, on Leon, but it was a matter of a few hundred dollars, which is why those Gold Star mothers, their fundraisers were so important, because these women didn't have any other income in a lot of cases. So, um, but yeah, and I have the notes when Harry was putting it, the money in the bank the whole time, payments, pay, their pay was late coming. When you know he would write and say, "Well, I still have in his journal, I still haven't gotten, I still haven't gotten Leon's pay. I'm still working on it." So, it was tough times financially. Yeah. You may not know this, but most of the casualties, were they all buried in France or would some be sent home? Some were sent home. I've talked to people who had relatives brought back to America. Um, I got to say, I mean, we were poor folks. We would, we, you know, they were going to bury him there, they buried him there. And, um, but some people did bring their boys home. And, you know, it's funny how the, the perceptions of those, because there's a, uh, pictures, this in the in my book, um, about uh, a big uh, memorial to the air, uh, air, they call them flyboys or something like that. And my great-grandmother refers to them as the millionaires, because they were the ones that could afford to go to France and become part of the war effort before we went into the war. And so, and they were only people who could really afford to do that were the, were the wealthy. So there was a whole lot of um, there was a lot of difference in how things were handled, depending on your finances. But we have a question up here in the back. I can't see. How was your family impacted by the influenza epidemic in 1918? How were they influenced by? The uh, influenza oh, epidemic? Oh, well, Harry, I have, I've got a lot of stories in all of my books about the Spanish influenza. And there's actually a story in... Um, in, from Richmond to France uh, about somebody that I know who lost a relative uh, during, to that. Uh, there was a lot of, I mean, there, were, there was a lot of uh, comments in Harry's journal about uh, lost this one, this uh, streetcar man to the flu. There's a whole story he wrote, very detailed, about losing his conductor to the flu, and that was in 1918, that during, during all that. But, um, of course, in, there were millions of people, more, more than died in the war in battle, were killed by the, the Spanish influenza. One, uh, one of my friends in Mosley, his mother here in Richmond died of the flu, and her son did not know until he came back. And he, because he was on the, um, he, well, of course, it took months for letters to get back and forth. But he, he was on the, uh, on the ship coming home. When he returned home, he found that his mother had died. But uh, the we didn't have anyone in our family that died of the influenza, but uh, the, the Elams that I mentioned, one of the Elam ladies um, had the flu, and she survived. So there was a, it was a, a real impact in Richmond, it really was, and in the war. Any other questions? Yeah. Got the mic. Hold on. Uh, what she lost her son. Where on the on the front did she, did he pass away? I mean, what what battle was he in? Well, it was in the Argonne Forest. And um, Randy, where are you? Um, are you in there, Randy? He must have started coughing. Yes. Oh, what do you, what do you know the name of? I mean, there wasn't a particular name of the battle. October fifth, one of the uh, American <laughs> three eighteen and seventeen uh, assaults with the Argonne Forest. Where he had a uh, yeah. 
It was actually at the end of the war. It was really like within that last month, but he, he was shot on the 7th or died on the 7th. But it was, it was in the Argonne Forest, but I don't think there was a particular name for the, uh, that particular battle. By a farm um, called Marie's Farm. By Marie's Farm. But we have notes about those things. And the sad thing for me, my great-grandmother's letters, reading them, it just break, it breaks your heart. She's writing letters to her son, and she's saying, I haven't heard from you. I haven't heard from you. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm so dis distraught. I hate to even write anymore because I don't know if you're getting my letters. Why are you not writing back? And all her letters, the reason I have those is because after he died, they were returned to her. So I've got these letters. He had sent her, she, in one letter, she talks about how I wish I could send you a birthday present, but I don't know how you would get it. And then he sent her a handkerchief with, you know, to mother on it and she was talking about I'll always hold on to this it, it's, it's still around I have it so there were so many things um, that were coming back and forth and the, the mail was slow uh, the letters I would look at the date as to what he would put in there and when it was received and there was a month at least difference in it not like today do you know what kind of camera equipment your grand <laughs> grandfather used? I have used? some of them <laughs> we have that's a cool thing uh, th this picture here, I think that's the camera that I have at home. It's kind of falling apart, but I have that. I have one of his box cameras. I believe he probably sent his wife to France with $1 Kodak camera because he, you know, he wanted to go send his good stuff with her. I have all of his bills from uh, Gillespie, I mean, Gillespie um, Optical, because that's where he bought his stuff. I've got those. I have his movie camera that he had, and I have, so I have all that. I have to. I'd have to look at the stuff to give you the names on all of it, but we have his movie camera, I have the instructions, and we have the movies, which VCU um, uh, Libraries has restored, and I show those too, if anybody's interested, uh, we do movie night. But um, I uh, have all those things, but the cool thing about provenance, and I know in a museum that's the big, that's the big buzzword, but I have a, um, a note that he, Harry wrote in his journal, it said, uh, Miss Day of Galiski Optical has loaned me free of charge moving picture camera and projection in the hopes that I will buy one in the coming year. That's October 1928, and he started taking mov movies, and I have movies of what we think might be one of the very first bird theater performances, you know, matinees. So he started taking, he bought the camera, used it, so I know where he got it, who he got it from, you know, when he got it, I have the movies, and I have the movie camera, and I have a picture of him taking that movie, one of the movies that we have. Somebody else took a picture of him taking the movie. So you can't have better, you, know, you can't have any better documentation than that. But yes, I do have some of his stuff, and um, you know, give us a call sometime. We'll be happy to go, to, Randy can tell you more about some of the things that we have. I, I don't pay that much attention. But I do have a picture of, I took a picture of my great, my great grandmother, his wife, was a carpenter as well as a school teacher, and she um, had made him, Leon, um, a child-sized secretary. And I have a picture, 100 years old, of that secretary with his movie camera and his regular camera sitting on top of it. So about a year ago, I put his movie camera and his regular camera on top of it, took another picture. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. But yes, we have his cameras, some of them.